So guys, um, I'm really, really excited to have Matt Baker here this morning. Um, if you don't know him, he's absolutely awesome. He is uh, Mr. HMO, let's call you that. Um, there is nothing that he doesn't know about HMOs. And he does it in a really, really fantastic way. And that's why I've been drawn to Matt. Um, loads and loads of recommendations. I've actually just done a course with Matt as well. Um, and it's been absolutely phenomenal. I've met his team um, and everyone around it. So I've really, really enjoyed that. Um, and guys, if we could just, uh, we are currently on Clubhouse. We're also, uh, this will go out on YouTube and we are also live on Facebook. So please do, those of you on Clubhouse, if you wouldn't mind just pinging six people who you think would find this really useful, um, especially if they're sources or they're looking at really great ways to give high returning value on their portfolio or looking to get into property as well. So please, please, I will um, ping a few people as well um, while Matt introduces himself and by the way Matt you don't have to mute yourself on Clubhouse so you should just be able to sit there chattering away um, and uh, as long as you're not shuffling papers around your phone you'll be fine so Matt for, for those of you who don't know you please do introduce yourself um, and just tell us a bit about yourself. Hi guys and um, first of all thank you so much Emma for having me on uh, and actually it has been a privilege uh, getting to know you over the last uh, you well, last couple of months as well. So um, I think you do some amazing things and are doing some amazing things in property. So uh, congratulations to you. And uh, yeah, so a bit about me, my name is Matt Baker. I am uh, a, a speaker, an author, an investor, an entrepreneur, a business owner, a father, uh, a piano player, and yeah, a musician, professional musician. We've got an album out. And uh, essentially, in my day to day, I, I, I wear three hats, uh, one of which is as a, an HMO and co living developer. So, we have a company called Scott Baker Properties where we create co living homes. And we won an award at the Property Investors Awards for that. And I wrote a best selling book all about it as well called Next Level Landlord. And uh, so, that was the 2022 awards. Um, my second hat is uh, I'll talk about hats because I know Emma you, you, you've got a, an array of hats that you love to wear so uh, my, my second uh, hat is as a, an educator and mentor and trainer and we work with other co-living well aspiring HMO landlords and existing HMO landlords to start and grow HMO portfolios we've been doing it for about five years very successfully and we have my, my third hat is as a, a managing agent. So we have a co-living operation called Co-Home and we manage uh, uh, shared houses the, the way that they should be done uh, in the Midlands and the South Coast in Kent. So, uh, and with, with the aim of being able to offer uh, like a really top level service uh, of, uh, to, well, to our landlords, but more importantly to our tenants, and um, we get that bit right, then we're, we've got a very successful business. Um, and that's essentially where we want to be. And and, and, and on the weekend, I play piano. <laughs> you literally make everyone, well, certainly I'm feeling a little bit lacking here. I can't play an instrument. I can't do this. I can't do that. You are a very busy man and, uh, you know, and obviously a lovely family man as well, um, as I've seen you out uh, holidaying with, with your family and doing all those lovely things. So I suppose first things first comes from how does one go from being a musician to an HMO property investor? That, that I think would be a, a great jump in. So if I jump back in time, probably where are we now? 2023, go back in time, 10 years or so. Uh, so all through my twenties, I was a gigging musician and I was looking for ways to basically create more income and any, anyone who's, who's self-employed, especially in the, in the creative industries, know that income is very choppy, very up and down. So how do I make that bit more income sustainable? And the, the, the way that I thought was actually teaching is a much more sustainable income. And, you know, there are bits about teaching I loved, a bit about teaching you know, that I, I wasn't so fond of. But it, what it did give me is stability and uh, yeah, a more consistent level of income. And I thought, actually, this is quite a good business. So I was a piano teacher, 
self-employed, sole trader, and then set up a music school and brought in other musicians to teach. Uh, and I just started to advertise more and market more for, for this. And, and that works really well. I think we had about seven or eight teachers at uh, our height, uh, the height of what we were doing. And it was when I was trying to grow that business that I went to an event about business growth. And they had people talking about social media marketing, about mindset, about wealth, and different strategies that you could do to grow business. And one of the strategies was you know, invest in property. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. And they were saying, well, you could do that with no money. Uh, you could do it with very little time as well if you did it right. And, you know, we all know the, the story. You know, people that have been in property education will, will you, you hear it time and time again. But yeah, you know, it really struck a chord with me on how you can invest in property, and it made a lot of sense. So. I did a course, a three-day course, and then went on to do some mentorship uh, with with one particular organization, and that got me started. And um, I bought my first couple of properties in that first year, and then very quickly realized I wanted to do the higher cash flow properties. At the time, I was then starting to take myself out of the music school business, hired a couple of piano teachers to teach my list, and I just held on to the, the students I wanted to teach. And then gradually, I moved out of that business altogether and moved to my investment area. Um, and they kept it going for a couple of years before I sold it once I'd set up my property portfolio. So, um, but the, the reason I went for HMOs is the high cash flow. And then quickly realized that because I'd lived in shared houses since I've been, basically been 18, um, probably up to the age of, well, I well, got married once, got divorced, ended back up in shared houses uh, after after the first divorce. And... Uh, and I've seen it all from the good, the bad, and the ugly, and realized that there must be a, a good way of doing shared houses. And back in 2015, when we started, yeah, the, yeah, there wasn't that much inequality. It was all, you know, everyone was telling investors, you know, rinse and repeat, you go bathe the box, you don't have to you don't live in it yourself. So when we started doing better quality um, and you know, a bit of a design to it, it was like top of the market, and we had. Yeah, we were getting £100 more per room per month than the agents were telling us we could. And uh, people would do, were taking the most expensive rooms first. And we were doing larger rooms, we were putting on suites in. And we suddenly realised, actually, this is a much better way of doing it. And I wanted to have a level of service that goes with it. So, And we all know most managing agents are just literally just about doing as little work as possible, <laughs> um, unfortunately. And I know that if, if you're a managing agent in this room, it's definitely not you, but the majority of the industry are still that way that way inclined. And so I wanted to have a level of service, which was second to none, where you know, tenants that are moving in, are they are the, you know, they have an experience they wouldn't experience. They, they have a, a you know, level of experience you'd expect from you know, staying in a nice hotel or from buying an Apple Mac at the Mac store. Uh, you know, something which you know is what you're going to get. So that's what we wanted from it. Um, and we just kept growing that and we, we just made the decision that every property we did was going to be better than the last. We're going to take the learnings from it, learnings in terms of what works in design, what, le- what works in the space, the layouts, what works in the, um, uh, you know, in, in the processes that we're putting in place. Um, and I worked with, I've worked with mentors the entire time through. I've still got mentors today um, that are helping me go from where I am to where I want to be in the next five years. So, um, so yeah, we started off in 2015, 2016, and then we doubled the size of our portfolio every year up until we hit the pandemic. So um, then it slowed, and then we're back on a growth trajectory. So, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. It's been uh, rewarding. It's been very stressful. And it's uh, been worth every every single moment. And I do love that. I think it's you know I think it's great to to be around people who are also realistic, um, because like all these things, yes, these things can be done. You know, did I start with no money? Yes, it wasn't my own money, but it you know it wasn't an easy journey. It was you know you know lots of highs, lots of lows, and constantly still lots of highs and lots of lows. Um, but that's 40... one thing that's just going to interrupt there. But mm. That's one of the things I forgot to mention is that I started with about forty thousand pounds in debt. You know, I was having this income from the from the the, 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 the music school, but you know, we still had this you know, this debt hanging over us that I was trying to sort out. You know, I thought it was the end of the world, and um, 
moving it forward so we had to do it with other people's money yeah absolutely and I think what you know what what is so important is that it, it is especially within the sort of property world and with you know really good positive property world is is the whole mindset thing and I know my life used to be a roller coaster. I mean, like the highs were up here and it would all be in about a space of 10 minutes, you know, whereas now what's so nice is coming into a community and especially having spent time with, with you and, and with many others um, is to be able to get that mindset where you can, you know, you still, shit still happens, excuse my French, but it's just how way we react to it now. And, you know, I I can sometimes laugh at the most extreme things that happen now. It's like, really? Is this really happening? OK, how are we going to how are we going to solve this? So, um, yeah. So I, I love that, that you literally have started from a from a position of extreme. And uh, I would imagine not many people are necessarily in that position. But if you are you know, know that you're not the only one, whatever situation or position you're in, that that's it. So uh, I really wanted to just kick off, Matt, is that, you know, there's so many people out there, either at the beginning of their journey, or maybe an accidental landlord. And there really are so many opportunities now, aren't there? I mean, you know, 20 years ago, it was literally just a buy to let. And then, you know, then it was HMOs, and then it's kind of service accommodation. And it's there's a lot about sort of supported living at the moment. I mean, where where do people start? Why I know you do other um, you know other strategies as well, but what is it for you that really has drawn you to HMOs and more this high level, which um, yeah you call the co living, isn't it? Which, which is that? What what draw drew you yeah. to that? Um, so so one of our one of our uh, core values within our business group is to build community. And one thing I've always been good at uh, from from my uni days and onwards was connecting people. And you know, it was starting off with, with bands, uh, you know, artists, musicians, and putting people together to create something which was greater than the sum of the whole. I really loved you know, pulling people together. So community has been at the heart of, of my life for you know, 20 years now. And when I got into property, I was told, you do a couple of buy to lets and then you go HMO because it has the cash flow. You need ca you know you need cash flow to make big dents in your income to make big changes to your life. So so when I when I did that first property training in the year 2015, I was like, okay, I'm going to HMO. Didn't really think more much more about it. Just like okay, I'm going to do a couple of buy to lets but then I just thought I'll just buy, buy an HMO straight away. So I did. So I went straight. I actually had the offer agreed on a on a buy to let and an HMO on the same day. To their house, which I converted to, to a five bed HMA, and it was from there that I thought, actually, how could we do the HMO better? Um, I, I, yeah, and I was still, I still had the people in my ears going, okay, these are your minimum room sizes. I was like, okay, six and a half square meters, six and a half, how many six and a half square meters? And then as I as we built the first one, which had probably one six and a half, two seven and a halves um probably a nine square meter and a 12 square meter room and it was quite clear very early on they all had on suites so it's like we're doing all on suites but it was very clear early on that the big one rented straight away the little ones just like uh, voids even though they rented you know, we get larger voids so you're having to play around with the rent so you're in that commoditized part of the marketplace where you're competing with other people on price Whereas at yeah, the higher quality, there was a lot less of that around. Therefore, I could pretty much charge what I wanted. And I saw that and I thought, well, why don't why am I just doing more of these? Why don't we do so we did a second one where it was a little bit better, so slightly larger rooms. And then I came across this commercial building, an old uh, offices in the right in the centre of Warrington. And uh, we walked past it a few times and it sold and uh, we, yeah, and, and then I rang them up and said, uh, yeah, how's the sale going? And they said, actually, it's about to fall through. We think, would you like to view it? So I rang up on exactly the right day and it came our way. And I managed to raise the, the, the 150K for this property, which became an eight bed HBO in the one bed flat. So it was a really great price. And I didn't really realize how great a price it was at the time. Uh, we bought it in cash using an investor uh, in, in, yeah, in, in full. And we just converted it, and it's 
probably one of the, one of still the best performing properties in our portfolio just because of obviously what we bought it for, what we were able to convert it for at the time. No, it's, it's not all singing or dancing you know, in design terms because it's still got the old beige box, the old you know furniture packs that you know everyone used to be, uh, be able to rage at the time. In fact, actually, that's, that's an interesting point because the second thing that I realized was that we started doing this and then other people started to do it as well. I talked about what I did. Other people, oh, that's quite a nice location. Or I'm just going down the road. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I was looking on Spare Room, our, our adverts that I was putting up, I self managed to start with. And the, our first couple of houses, you know, we were at the top there, you know, nothing really competing. After about after about 12 to 18 months, I started to see other nice looking rooms popping up. And they were identical to ours because they were using exactly the same furniture pack, exactly the same gray feature wall, exactly the same um, like artwork from the same um, company, which will remain nameless. <laughs> and you know what? they were great for a time. And they're, they're, yeah, they're still going and probably have evolved since then, but you know, they're, they're a better furniture for suppliers that I use now. Um, but what, what I realized is that we were no longer standing out. We'd taken this good quality product and then then around us, the commoditized marketplace had, had, had uh, appeared. So at that point, I was like, hang on a minute, this, this, isn't, this is good, but we've got to stand out more. So that's where I, I realized we have to be in the top 5% of our market and we have to stand out. So we have to create a product, a service, which is different to everyone else's. And that would be my advice to anybody getting into HMOs, is that if you're going to do something, Avoid the middle. Avoid the marketplace where all you're doing is competing on price. We've proven that our model is pandemic proof because our rooms filled at market beating rents in 2020, 2021. And I know other people drop their rents. They're still trying to get their rents back up to what they should be, um, which is actually easier now because rents have jumped quite a bit. But okay, for the first year, it's like, well, you've got somebody paying 450 in a house where someone else is paying 650. 600, yes, but people then start to get a bit miffed, go, what's going on here? So people beat up. So it was all about standing out and, and we've proven that. And you know what? Um, when you're choosing locations and areas to invest, it's about making sure that you've got your tenants, your backup tenants, and your back of your backup tenants. Because that's what's going to provide you with resilience in, in a recession. And but again, if you've still got the best product in the market, people will still want it. I love it. I love Especially it. Especially in a market where the where the demand is so strong, and there, there's probably only one or two markets at the moment that I would avoid because it's been overdone. Um, but at the moment, the, the demand across the UK is is so strong that you know, pretty much anywhere will work if you follow this model. Oh, fantastic! And so, I mean, I I really love this kind of. I was quite shocked actually. Uh, I went around a you know a friend's portfolio and. I'm not used to bog standard buy to lets. You know, I'm service accommodation background. So all of my properties look sparkly and clean and beautiful. And you're proud to kind of walk them in, walk people in. And, you know, they really, you know, they're quite sort of show stopping, so to speak. And then going around bog standard buy to lets, <laughs> it's just a bit like, oh my gosh, is this, is this what it like? So that I suppose. For me, that's what really has has drawn me to you as well is is producing this product that is you know really beautiful and and also again you you feel really proud to have your tenants living there and and likewise I'm sure they do I mean I remember living in um in my halls well not my in my house it, I don't think it was called an HMO then but anyway in my uni house it was so disgusting <laughs> I mean it literally had like mushrooms growing in the kit in the bathroom it was just awful it was whereas now i hear that you know students housing is is beautiful um and really amazing so just as understanding with you i know is am i right in thinking that you've got the high end but there may be occasions where you know there is a property that you buy that you know maybe just isn't possible to make it so nice it might not be big enough to maybe have on suites or all those other things um do you kind of still run them as as an hmo or do you put them into something like supported living or any other things how, how do you sort of work your portfolio so when we're buying new stock we uh, essentially we, we've got this 
uh, this graph that I, I drew in, in my book, which essentially is looking at where the most profitable strategies are. And in terms of you know, residential, it's HMOs and high quality HMOs, top five to 10% of the market. And then on the other side, uh, you've got the social housing supported living where you've got long uh, FRI leases in place, whereby you can essentially you're getting a bonus for providing a service, which is again, really needed. So, um, and so what we have done is we've taken uh, any property which happened to be stuck in the middle and we've taken it either to high end or taken it and put it on, on long leases. So uh, that's how we've dealt with it. You know, our buy to lets, they are, they're, they're just buy to lets. You know, there's not the same issue with that because buy to lets just rent out all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and we just do them nice. You know, we don't do yeah, your beige box, not bag, no, your walls. It's a, li a little bit of, of nicety and uh, and just maintain them, and we just keep them, um, and they just tick over in the background. But with the high the high cash flow stuff, there's more involved. There's more reg regulation legislation, but with with that extra uh, oversight comes the extra profit. So, with an HMO in a shared house, I want to avoid management challenges, avoid problematic tenants. But they generally come in the middle when you're at the, the, the kind of the bottom of this this curve, where the top on one side you've got high end, not nice quality and the top on the other side, you've got someone else dealing with the tenants. So because these people are generally either challenged in some way, they've got such circumstances that they're in. Um, and I would say that, yeah, you actually always supported living. I say supported living follows a similar trend where you want to be at the top, the higher end, because that's where you're going to get fewer, fewer challenges. People are more likely to respect the property and look after it and you can command a much better uh, nightly rate. Um, yeah, but when it comes to, to the, the properties which are too small to be, or what I would call a next level HMO, then that would end up probably in some kind of supported living, social housing capacity, where I don't have to worry about uh, having to manage the, the, the tenants, or it's just a straightforward buy to let. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what we've done. We had a couple of problematic HMOs in the Midlands and we tried professional tenants. We didn't put on suites in every room because we thought this area hasn't up and come just yet. So we're going to avoid that. It, yeah, it has up and come quite a bit since then. And to one of our clients owns probably the most number of rooms in this area um, now. So he, he went and kind of owned the area whilst we were elsewhere. And then we decided we weren't going to invest money into the properties. We were going to change the strategy to then get higher income. So then we, Basically, we, we rented, rented, rented it out to someone else. So someone charges a nightly rent to contractors or to charities or to supported living providers. And uh, we just take the guaranteed rent, which is better than we were getting as a commoditized HMO. Because we don't have to worry about any of the bills. And basically, what, what you say, you take that um, gross rent, that you, sorry, the gross rent you were getting, and it becomes your net rent as a um, strategy. So we're very happy with how those are performing now. Once we've solved the problem and shifted it from one to the other side of our curve, as it were. Fantastic. And that's, yeah, that's what I really like is to be able to, there's nothing worse than, you know, especially when you're starting out to see a property and be kind of like, oh, I don't really, it doesn't quite fit into that mold. It doesn't quite fit into this. And, you know, it can be quite panicking, I think, for people. Um, and especially it's, it's one thing that I say, it's taken me, what, nearly five years to really understand the business of of property because inherently that's what it is it's a business but we're so used to just kind of like buying and and then just putting it into a strategy whatever that is um oh, i've got all the dogs can you hear the dogs in the background i can hear the dogs <laughs> they'll shut up in a minute having fun having fun somewhere shut up um <laughs> now they're gonna start howling just hopefully they'll calm it's down fine. It's only I can hear I can hear you more than the Oh, dogs. that's good. Okay. Um yeah, so now I've lost completely my train of thoughts. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, knowing what to to do with the properties um and and yeah, and sort of moving them forward. And that's yeah, that's what I really love about you know, your strategy is that you've got something for for every uh for every um, you know, result. Hold on 2 seconds, Matt. Hold that thing. Hold on. Hold on. No problem.
There we go. It whipped into shape back there. Well, well, uh, Emma's gone. Um, oh, just while you're there, oh, you're back. But um, the what I'd say is you're talking about having a, a strategy for any property. Um, I generally flip on its head and go, what is my strategy and why am I doing it? And go hunt for that particular type of property and be very, very deliberate with sourcing. If you're very deliberate with sourcing, you're much more likely to find what you're looking for. If you go, you're going, I'm just going to, I just need a property. Then what you end up doing is you find yourself looking at all these different potential opportunities and go, well, I'm not entirely sure what to do with this, you know, what to do with this one. I think this is a good price, but I don't know because I've not done that strategy before and, do, and, and all of this. And, and I think that those people that progress quickly in property or perce are perceived to progress quickly in property are those that hone in on one strategy and do one strategy at a time. So you could spend two years just trying to find a below market deal and go and then find one in two years because you looked at every type of strategy. Uh, and in the meantime, um, someone else, not that you should compare yourself to others, but when you see other people go, well, this guy's just gone and bought five HMOs in a year and now he's doing below market deal sourcing. It's because he, think, because he or she is focusing on one thing at a time and building up the strategy, which is the most important, that delivers the most important result for that person at that moment in time. Oh, and Matt. That's, that, that is so, so key. I love that. And it is something that I talk about a lot and in fact there is somebody local to me and he started out um uh deciding to do eight hmos but five beds so he uh, around us and you'll you'll probably know that matt is is in kent as well you know the old-fashioned three bed terraced houses where you go in and the stairs straight up anyway so he kind of like got one uh converted it into um you know five bed hmo and he thought oh, it wasn't too hard that worked really well and he had a really big goal um, and he started doing, you know, four a year. And then he started doing, you know, multiple units over the year as well. And it's kind of like, and he is literally flying. Whereas other people, as you say, who are kind of like this whole shiny penny. And, and let's be fair, I'm I'm in that as well, because I'm an entrepreneur. And so, I love it. It's like, oh, I'd love to do that. Oh, I'd like to do, you know, it's so normal for us all. But if we can, and that's what I talk about when, with coaching, is to it's if you want to move ahead and generally people have got an, a problem haven't they they're wanting to overcome so like you had debt you know other people might want to get out of their job there's so many things that there'll be a reason why they're doing it some people just want extra income some people want a pension whatever it is is i always say you once you've reached that goal then you can do your shiny penny if you want but let's get the foundations in place so that you got you know things to support you so that if it does take you then two years and then you go oh why didn't I just go back to just doing the HMO thing so I love that right so for me and as you know Matt we've we've had a chat about this I am writing a book and I've nearly it ugh, we're, we're I'm actually quite excited how near the end I am of this book um on area so to me area is just one of the most important things and certainly um for serviced accommodation there's so many people that you know i've seen who take on rent to rents or change their buy to lets and say things like oh i hope it works oh i'm just like no please let's not do go down the hope route that's just never a good business strategy let's go down a due diligence route and i really um, loved the way that you do your due diligence on areas. Um, so, yeah, could you tell us a bit more? Because I'm sure it's, you know, again, well, I know it's a little bit different to, to service accommodation, obviously. So what is it that you look for in, in an area? And and also, I think another key question is, are you close to home or far away? Where wh Which camp do you sit in there? Okay, so... When I started, I was far away. So I was living in Oxfordshire and uh, was investing in, in the Northwest in Warrington. And then, as I said earlier, I moved to Warrington and that actually made life quite a lot easier in terms of getting deals because I could be there because um, I was self-employed. I really had control of my time. So that was one of the benefits of, of, of my starting point was, yes, I was, um, I was time poor when I was working from a distance. But, but I got my first deals agreed from a distance, got them, got them going. They weren't really cash flowing yet, but I realized that I could 
systemize my business better to still have a decent income. And then um, I moved in with my parents, the age of 30, 31, something like that. Um, and consolidated my, so I didn't need as much income. So I thought I'm going to decrease my expenses. This can be done in many ways, um, but you know, following the, you know, the rules, you want to decrease your expenses, increase your income. So I was decreasing my expenses, um, systemizing my time so I could have more time to focus on the business. So I continued having the income from the music school. Um, then I was on site when, um, uh, yeah, I, and I built a really good relationship with one particular valuer who worked with these space agents who would just call me pretty much like you know, once or twice a week. So I've got this particular deal. Um, can you, you want to come around? Um, uh, I've just signed it. I'm going to go do the floor plans or whatever, look at it whilst I'm, whilst I'm there. So that's where, yeah, I, I got that relationship. In fact, I talk about it in the book, it's called the beer test in terms of you know, whether you've got a good enough relationship with your agent to be able to take it for a beer and for that not to be weird. So um, I had that relationship with him where I, yeah, I did go for a beer, you know, every few weeks. Cause he was very interested in what we were doing. So how are you doing that? Um, and then he left and went to go sell cars at Audi. I thought, oh, okay. oh, he's no. still there now. We're friends on Facebook. He's still there now. Um, so he's obviously prefers cars to houses. But um, what was the question? Location. So, yeah, I started off investing from a distance. And then I moved to my location. It did help speed things up, but it, I was able to operate both. Currently, I live uh, on the south coast uh, in West Sussex. I invest in Kent. I've been to Kent from, well, to our location maybe two or three times. We're working with a builder on the ground there. So he, he obviously lives around the corner from the property. He helped find them and source them. So I've joint ventured the distance, um, which again has been very helpful. When I formed my partnership with Niall, Niall Scott's got back properties. Again, I joint ventured the distance, but this time he joint ventured the distance. He was in London, I was in the Northwest. We started buying stuff together up there in Lancashire. So I could go view them. He came up and we made a source for the finance. And uh, yeah, location. It is very, very key for HMOs because you can't put an HMO in the middle of the countryside, for example, because, I mean, you can, but you have to know who your ideal tenant is, who's going to be living there. So location comes back to who your tenant is. So the methodology that I write about in the book is the tenant first method. And it's about in any other business, you would go, who's my customer? What is their problem? How can I solve their problem? And if you manage to identify the right person and the right solution for that person, then you will make money. You have a successful business. It's very, very simple and straightforward. The how you do it is where people generally can mess it up. But um, if you do that right, it is straightforward. And same with housing. Who is my ideal customer? Who is my ideal tenant? How, what is it that they're looking for? Uh, what is it that they need and where do they need it? So ultimately, I need to go where the people are and where the, where the right type of people that need shared accommodation are. So, uh, there are people across the entire spectrum of ages, from the ages of uh, 18 all to 80, or, or 80 to 100 even, or plus. It, every age group, there is a need for shared accommodation. Um, but the strongest age groups are probably the 18 to 35, and they're probably the 65 to 100s. You know, it's those two age groups because they're, they're in care homes again. They're in shared living, right? So, and a care home, well, not, not even a care home, a residential home is essentially a form of HMO at the end of the day. So those are the, the, the types of, of the age groups that need it the most. And then when you go through you know, 35 to 60, it's those people that are more, probably more transient, they're in need of short-term accommodation, um, a lot of divorced men over the age of 40, yeah, that type of thing. Uh, yeah, we've had a few of those that you know, apply for rooms in, in the time. And the different strategies across, across the um, you know, spectrum of ages but who is it what do they need and then where is that required so yeah you know, you know, the top 20 major towns and cities good place to start the bigger the market the better because your competition is going to be less um which is a, kind of a weird thing to say but if you have a small market and lots of competition you're in, in trouble because your top five to ten percent is only like you know 30 40 rooms or you know, so you're limiting your maybe not 30, 40 rooms, like 50, 60 rooms, you're limiting um, your ability to, to deliver the strategy there. Whereas if you go to a very large market, you know, they, they need thousands upon thousands of rooms. So you'll then be able to scale the business. So location is key. Um, 
but I, I love the idea of doing something a bit different to your standard young professional agents. We're really young professional agents. Most we don't be students. The student market is, is different. They require quality shared housing. Um, the young professionals require quality shared housing because they can't afford to live in flats anymore because the bills are too extortionate. It actually, we do a sum very often whereby uh, if you go to look at a one bedroom flat or a studio flat where the tenant is paying the bills and everything on top of their rent, and you compare that for a year versus uh, living in a high quality shared HMO. Um, if you do that sum, generally tenants are saving somewhere between two and seven thousand pounds a year by living in your high quality shared accommodation with uh, maybe the you know, a bedroom which is the same size as the one they would have had. They don't have their own private kitchen anymore, but they've got maybe a large kitchen. Maybe they've got a garden. They've got more facilities than they would have had if you do what we produce as opposed to what they would have had living in their flat. And generally, their flat is going to be a beige box. No thoughts to it. Yes, they can put their own furniture in it, their own stamp on it, but can they? That is open to interpretation as well. Because we provide a better looking, better um, feeling property, and it's cheaper for them. Wow, that's, I mean, that's really powerful, isn't it? Two to seven grand a year savings. That really is. Wow. OK. And so who is do you have a specific tenant that you go for? Yeah, we, we do young professionals. Yeah, so yeah. between the ages of uh, 22, 23 and 35, that's where we are. That is the the, the co-living model generally fits that, that target market because um, they're more likely to be single or couples. As soon as you get to families where you've got kids involved, this model doesn't work as well if you want a, a co-living model with families it then becomes more um apartments or houses in in communities and yes like uh historically um co-living included things like long houses that go back hundreds of thousands of years even where you'd have a number of families living in one building that have their own space plus space for animals etc spaces like that do exist in other countries and there, there are some experimental areas in the uk where um you get your house and you get communal uh dining rooms communal swimming pools and all of that so that is on one end of co-living whereas what we're looking at is that accommodation which is um all in one building they've got all their facilities in one building as well and anywhere from four people sharing up to probably 50 people sharing is the, the type of uh property that we would um call a small scale co-living um and yeah from the age of 22 23 to 35 probably post university all the way up to the time where they're looking to settle down have kids and all and, and all of that and generally people are choosing to stay longer uh, we've seen that in the stats if you look at the co-living um occupation stats the average age of the co-living tenants now over 30 in london and over 28 nationally uh, the average tenancy of a co-living tenant is 18 months. Ours are closer to two years. Um, so people are staying and they're choosing this form of accommodation. Because if you create property which is the top 5%, why are they going to move out? They're not going to move out to find somewhere better unless it's a better location for them, which could be to do with their location of work, um, or whether it's whether they've now... You know, moving in with friends or, or relatives or um, you know, a loved one. Um, or they, you're having kids. You know, we've, we've had a, uh, yeah, a couple of people move out over the last seven, eight years because you know, they, they start to have a family and they go into different types of accommodation. Um, and yeah, and that's the age range that we see. We see. So that's the type of demographic we have young working professionals, um, and it probably is more. So there's the white collar workers, uh, some blue collar workers as well. But again, the difference between blue collar, white collar workers now is very blurred um, because you have people working in Amazon factories who are highly uh, talented engineers, you know, fixing uh, robots. You know, that is that's the type of person you might have uh, living in your in your house or an IT contractor uh, who works from home. Uh, you know, uh, or the person who works in local HSBC. All these types of people live in um, our houses. Fantastic. No, I really love that. And for me, it's um, 
<laughs> it seems like a, a growing market, especially, you know, supposedly, you know, the big cost of living, although I would have questioned the cost of living this weekend when I like the shops just seem to be crazy at the moment. There just be, it seems to be everyone going out shopping. So um, it begs to wonder that I think Black, like, Black Friday started. Yeah. Oh, yeah is already, it? Is that early. what it was? Um, but yeah, it was really, really busy at the weekend. So it, you know, what what I can see with you as well, and you've talked a lot um, sort of earlier as well, is about kind of building relationships. And guys, if you've got any questions, we're obviously going to be coming to a close at about one o'clock. So if you've got any questions, chuck them in now, because I will be attempting to manage some time here. But yeah, you, and especially talking to you and, and having, you know, spent time with you and working with you on your courses and stuff, relationships are really key um you've talked about a, a relationship with the valuer I mean that just sounded incredible relationships with the agents agents um you've done a lot of joint ventures you've got partners um you know how, how would you sort of advise people who are a bit kind of fearful of this you know they're kind of maybe new and especially when going in to to see agents I remember you know, feeling really scared about going into a state agent because I felt like they knew everything and I didn't. And I kind of almost felt like I had to go in and just pretend to know everything. Um, I don't feel like that now. Um, and certainly I don't think they know everything either, not even necessarily about your area, but some of them do. And obviously you want to pick that. So have you got any advice for people about this kind of building relationships, how to get that kind of confidence, whether it be an agent, whether it be that value, I definitely need to find out how to do that or whether it be working with a partner. So I think the first thing to do is, well, the, the first step along the road to success was the first one. So you've got to actually go and, and have a conversation and not be precious about how it goes because you can walk into an estate agent and you get a Saturday boy or girl sitting at the desk who knows absolutely nothing, is on their phone, just waiting till they can get to the pub at you know, five o'clock, um, who's not going to be particularly helpful. And you can have a conversation with them and suddenly realise that you know a hell of a lot more about property than they do. And in fact, anybody who's done any property education, even the poor quality stuff, will know 10 times more than most estate agents. Um, and... Uh, and, Did you uh, ever get that, Matt? I've, I've had that before. My somebody's paid thousands and thousands of pounds for education. They've had coaching, and then they say something like, "Well, I spoke to the agent the other day, uh, the letting agent, and they told me that this wasn't a good area." I'm like, "Really? <laughs> what you want to believe them? Have they done the course? Have they done no?" What do they know? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm totally with you on that one. And it's the same, like we had, we had um, it was actually one of the guys on the same course that you did uh, was talking about rents that you could get in a specific area. And yeah, you were do we were doing test ads in this area and we were proving that you could get 150, 200 pounds a month more than the local letting agent was saying. So the local letting agent is just not trying to get any higher rents. They're, like, they're renting out at 600, 650, that's fine. But like, you know what, we put a good quality photo of a, of a good quality room. You can, you can get tens of inquiries at 800. And it's like, well, why? why? Because you might be thinking, well, why am I pushing the rent up? Because um, it's, it's, it needs to be an affordable part of the marketplace. But you know what? The rent of a beige box will continue to rise um, without, without you know, the competition because the, 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 the ability to create new HMOs is harder and harder and harder. So, if I can get more rent at the end, it's going to justify the expense and the, um, and the deal to be done. Sometimes I need that rent to be 750, 800, 850 a month across six, seven, eight, nine bedrooms to justify the expense of doing that project and to make it a good cash flow generator. And also to provide uh, to, to buy the properties which actually fit that strategy. So um, that's, that's why the rent being higher is, is good. But again, local agents, coming back to that, I think... You need to go in and not sound like you know it all. If you go in and you sound like you know it all, the agent's not going to like you anyway. So being humble, first and foremost. And the second thing, given that I've just seen the, the time we're coming towards the end, um, is, is something that I actually do talk about on day two of our upcoming HMO Hunt Challenge. And um, uh, there's a, a 
So there's a script that I wrote, which covers the main point of how to get an agent interested in working with you, interested in um, putting you above other people, because yeah, you, you, they're not gonna, you're not going to be the only person that rings them saying, oh, I'm, just, I'm looking for property in the area, I'm an investor. Um, so how do you stand out from the crowd? It's the same with you know, your houses, you want them to stand out. How is How do you as an investor stand out so that that agent wants to work with you? And of 10 agents in an area, maybe two or three will be really helpful and the rest will be useless. They just also bear that in mind. You don't have to build a rapport with, ev with every single one of them. You want to be consistent in your approach and going back to them all the time, but there'll be others that you will take out for lunch and they'll be the ones that will bring you up and say, I've just found exactly what's on your hunting brief. This is the one which um, you need to come and look at now. Or if you can't get here, um, I'll send you a video or send a viewer or whatever and they get you know, get put an offer in this property now because it's what you want and I know the agent or the vendor will take X happy days amazing amazing yeah and I do like that I think you um, you look at things quite differently when approaching those kind of relationships and especially the relationships with agents and um, yeah <laughs> certainly your your hunting brief it's it's a, a very clear picture, which you're literally sharing with the agent. This is who I am. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, really key, really powerful, you know, with my service accommodation, you know, leaving a leaflet with them. If somebody, you know, is, is between houses, think of us. All of these things, if you can leave something physical is, is such a benefit. And I think really does bring you sort of top of mind uh, in, that, in that way as well. Um, we've got um, a couple of questions come in. So we will just touch on those quickly. So um, Sharon has asked about getting involved in rent to rent social housing. So Sharon, I've got great news for you. The next two weeks are going to be all about kind of supported living and that whole remit. So tune in for the next two weeks. Um, I've got Lisa Brown next week and then a, a few others the following week. So that'll answer your question. And then Ali has asked a question of you, Matt, um, about your exit strategy. Have you got one? Um, and what is next for you after property? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so uh, thanks, Ali. And thank you for your comment. I found the questions bit on, on the app, so I'm just looking at this. Brilliant. Uh, chat, thanks for your comment earlier, Ali, as well, which is yeah. brilliant. I'm glad you like, like the book. So exit strategy, um, well, hopefully in about 100 years I will die. That's my exit strategy. Um, so the kids, that's the, the main one, is, is um, you know, handing over a successful portfolio to the kids. Yeah. And at the moment, I probably say my portfolio is definitely not where I want it to be, so I'm still working on it. Um, and so, but as a part of that, because we work with investors, part of that is consolidating a portfolio um, wh whereby there's no one else involved. So I can very cleanly hand a portfolio to my kids. So uh, it's about rationalizing joint venture partners. So you might go into business with someone for like four or five years. Now, Nile and myself are actively looking at how can we be out of business with each other and do business in a different way so that we have our own different portfolios in other ways so that. Um, he doesn't he doesn't have kids not going to have kids like that's he wants to build a portfolio for a different reason and i would now want to build a portfolio for this reason so the first five years it suited our purpose and now we're looking at how can we evolve so exit, my exit strategy is how can we build our personal family portfolio now um using what we've got and and um basically uh, and leveraging all the knowledge and the contacts and the investors and everything um doing capital projects we're now building houses as well that's our, something that we're working on uh, we've got our first one again happening in kent at the moment um is that and, ground up uh, Matt? so the first one is actually a, is a bungalow conversion to a large five bed executive home and uh we're applying for planning for the one in the garden which i don't see why it would be refused so that would be ground up from the garden and then we're like we're appraising like four or five different sites, land we're planning up to about ten homes. So we're stepping into capital-based projects again to reduce the need for investors in our investment if that were. So that when we bring in investors, it goes into developments, and then the profits then go into our investments. So that's the way that we're moving it before. Whereas to start with, we had investors coming into our investment properties, which means that now 
I'd like to pay some of them out and have those properties um, for, for just for myself, if that makes sense. So that's um, moving forwards. And then after after property, you know, you know we're, we're, there will be no after property for us. So, you know, I'm in property for, for, for life now. Um, and it'll just be at what matter of, or to, to, of degree. So is it something whereby I'm going to be like actively looking for projects, funding projects, involved in projects? Um, I'm always going to be a landlord. I'm always going to have investments. So there's always going to be rent coming in. There's always going to be a property. Um, but also we've got the album. I would like to write another album, get it out there. I haven't really had the time to promote it well. Um, and you know, we're looking for booking agents to, to promote the gigs. I'd love to take a year where we just focus on music and doing gigs, um, but we're not there yet. Um, so we do it more sporadically. Um, but also with, with our training and, and coaching and mentoring, you know, that's growing as well. We've got, um, um, so we have a platform is one, which is specific around HMOs and cash flow properties. Um, for the more advanced uh, property investors, we also have our supported living platform as well, um, which was launched over the summer. And we've got a supported living challenge coming up the end of November as well. So, um, so Sharon, that might be of interest to you. So um, it's... And with, with that in mind, yeah. um Matt, I'm uh, aware that uh, I mean, I, I certainly I got my husband to to come and do your your challenge, and of course I'm there, yep. you know, doing it with him as well. Um, so yeah, tell us about wh how people can find you, um, all your kind of training and what you offer. Yeah, so on the HMO front, um, you know, this is something whereby you know we do believe we've got the best HMO training in the country. Uh, because it is specific to HMOs, you know, uh, I that's just, which is what I do, and I have a team of people that work with me to deliver about HMOs. So if you want to go and do a broad spectrum of training, you know, we're not the place for you because we focus on getting successful HMO portfolios off the ground. So um, uh, yeah, we we uh, so we obviously have courses that obviously you've been on, but we have this free HMO hunt challenge, which is a lot of content. Which I deliver, uh, and it's next week. Um, so as you depends when you're listening to this. Um, but it is the oh, got the dates now. Get my diary up. We're the next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth of November. And I popped and, a link, guys, in the in the well in here, and we'll obviously pop a, a link in as well. Oh yes, yeah, so, so, yes, yeah, so, Emma's got a link. You can uh, register, uh, even if you know you can't make one or some of the dates then do come along because uh, we will record it. You can watch it back uh, the next day. But the whole point of the challenge is to get you started in finding uh, your first or your next HMO. So uh, we've had complete beginners go in there and actually build a pipeline. And we guarantee that you'll get at least 30 leads of properties which are HMOs or have potential to become HMO conversions. Um, so on day one, we will show you how to set up your pipeline using a piece of technology that we work, that we use. On day two, um, we're going to go through that script that I said on, and how to build that relationship and rapport with those agents. So we're going to go through that in the hunting brief, the things that you need to do to, as I say, um, get, 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 that, get that in front of the agents. So it follows on from step one. Step one finds the lead. Step two starts to imp yeah, implement, go viewing. And then in step three, we talk about putting your offers forward and uh, then how you can do this um, either to purchase properties yourself so if you've got capital to invest then obviously you go and you, know, you need to know how to get the best use of your capital if you don't have capital i'm going to show you uh, why people are going to invest in you and and some of the, uh, some tips around uh, raising finance and also uh, if you're if you get really good at finding deals how you can start to sell them on to make between five and fifteen thousand pounds uh, per deal which uh, which is brilliant so over the course of the three days lots of content uh, to get the most out of it, please do come Tuesday night. I suppose at half seven, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night for an hour, an hour and a half. I like to waffle, so it's more like an hour and a half. And we do Q and A's a bit as well. So, and there will be a bonus Q and A after, uh, after a week. So, I'll give you homework every day. So, on the first day, do some content. Then there'll be an exercise to do, um, and then start to. Um, oh, and there's a prize. We do have a prize uh, as well, which is worth about three thousand pounds. So if you attend and and uh, you do some of the actions I'm going to ask you to do, and you can prove that you've done those actions, you entered in to win that prize. Um, and yeah, over the course of that week, we've had so on the we did it the first time in August. 
and, and over the course of the you know, that week of the, the challenge starting on, on next Tuesday, the last time we did it, we had people getting offers accepted. Um, and that's on a free HMO hunt challenge. And then we've also had people go on and uh, you know, do multiple uh, deals over the past couple of months since we ran that in August. Yeah, it is amazing. And yeah, so much, uh, you know, very generous with your time and everything there, Matt, because it is totally free for those three days. And um, and yeah, it's uh, very valuable. So I can highly recommend um, anyone who's interested to to definitely jump on that. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very much uh, nearly the top of the hour. Um, so I will uh, come come back in a sec. But yeah, everyone, um, this is obviously we're currently on Club House. We're live on Facebook and this is also going to be on YouTube as well. And we will also drop break this down into shorter segments as well. Um, so if you need to just, uh, you know, watch something very quickly just for 10 minutes, then you have that option as well. So that's Emma Howe at Pure Abode. So do come and find and subscribe to that. Um, and then also any of you, and I don't know if you do, but um, I'm actually speaking in Sittingbourne next, we uh, next Wednesday at the Property Millionaire uh, Networking Group. So if you're in and around Kent, do please come there. Um, and I will be talking about sort of systemization and automation um, around having sort of virtual assistants joining your team as well so if you're interested in that that would be great as I've already mentioned next week or the next couple of weeks we're really talking about supported living and it sounds like we all need to also go to Matt's um, uh, supported living event um, at the end of November did you say? Yeah so we've actually got a supported living challenge as well which um, uh, I wasn't uh, wasn't going to talk about because obviously you've been talking about HMOs but 28th, 29th, 30th of November is a sports living challenge. We haven't started promoting it yet because we we're currently promoting our HMO hunt. Um, but that is hot off the press. Hear it here first. Um, you hear you, you literally have heard it here first. I haven't talk, told anyone else in the in the wider world about it yet. Um, partly because it's still being created, but it is in the diary for 28th, 29th, 30th, and that is led by two of our very successful clients, Max and Alex. Uh, so Max Rayner and Alex Baker of Stuart Clinton Property. Uh, they also won. Uh, one of the Property Investors Awards uh, for their deal, and they're nominated for another deal. And in fact, we've got, and they were one of our first clients. Um, we've actually got nine nominees, so not nine finalists of the Property Investor Awards uh, of current and ex HBO platform clients. So um, it's the place to be. Oh, that's really, that's, you know, that is an accolade, if ever you could say one, Matt. So, um, yeah, that's really great. Well, look, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. I really, really appreciate you being here and um, sharing your incredible knowledge, um, your your generosity in what you give out to, um, you know, the wider community. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it to you. Is there something to, you know, that you want to close with to kind of encourage people perhaps to to look down this route? Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of bad press about HMOs. People are a bit scared of them. There's you know, talk of Article 4s. There's talk of you know, council tax banding of rooms. You know, all these things which, uh, you know, people go up there and say, this is an excuse not to do anything. And go, you know, I'm just going to do something easy. I'm going to do something easy like rent to rent or easy like rent to SA or something like that. And it's like, well... Each individual challenge has it. So each individual strategy has its own individual challenges, and it's about understanding which is the one which is right for for you. If you're looking to invest and purchase properties using your own cash or someone else's cash, so I venture cash, angel investor cash, um, HMOs is the way to do it because you've got income, you've got an asset, and you're creating homes for people. So this is why I love it as a, a as a foundational strategy for anyone who's doing property investment should be doing HMOs, especially if they're looking to um, move out of a, you know, a day job, move out of you know, buy to less investing, because it is hugely secure as an income, hugely secure as an income, if it's done the right way in the right place. 
Love it. Love it. Well, that's absolutely awesome. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, we you. really appreciate that. And um, yes, yeah, so lovely to chat to such a multi-talented person um, and joining us here today. So yeah, if, if you haven't already, jump on that link, um, go and join Matt for his um, free uh, challenges um, and really, you know, benefit from that as I certainly have. So yeah, brilliant. Okay, Matt. Well, look, thank you so much. I'm going to shut down the rooms now and um yeah and uh, amazing thank you again brilliant thank you very much